Hey guys, today I'm going to be answering more of your beauty questions. I do these videos around once a month and they're just so much fun. I love hearing what questions you guys have for me and I love sharing my tips and tricks with you and also my thoughts on the beauty industry, favorite products. So these are just a lot of fun. So let's go ahead and just jump right into it. I have quite a few questions. I'm sorry that I won't be able to get to everybody's, but hopefully I will in the next round. So question number one is as a review, or do you ever get overwhelmed by all of the new products and brands coming out? How do you decide what to try and what to skip? So yes, I definitely get overwhelmed, so much so. Sometimes I just look around this room and I'm like, I can kind of feel the anxiety a little bit, but I think for me, I have to look at this as it's my job to have all this stuff. Obviously, I'm never going to use it all and I have to be okay with that. Um, and I think my mindset as a content creator is gonna be different than you guys being because a lot of times I'm buying products for my channel, which I wouldn't be doing if I didn't have this channel. I think my whole mindset about buying beauty products would be very different. But even when it comes to my channel, I think in the past I used to buy everything that came out. I wanted to review every single product and these days I'm a little bit more selective. I don't purchase everything. I think if I didn't have this channel, I would probably, when I saw a new product, I would think about my own collection and think about what I have that's maybe very similar to that already, especially when it comes to color cosmetics like eyeshadow palettes, blushes, lipsticks, things like that. I think I'm more inclined to be interested in purchasing something if it's more unique or maybe it has like a special formula, for example, like a lipstick that has claims that it's going to smooth out your lip lines or something that kind of sounds more interesting than just a typical lipstick. I might be more inclined to purchase it. I'm very interested in just trying new formulas and seeing if they be the old formula. And usually if things are drugstore, I tend to just purchase them without thinking about it too hard. If it's a higher end product, I typically wait and watch some reviews first. And oftentimes it ends up that I'm actually not interested in it because the people that I trust here on YouTube, let's say if they didn't like something, then I'll probably just skip it anyway. So I would say a good rule of thumb is just when you see a new product, see if you can dupe it within your own collection. And number two, just wait until you see some reviews coming out don't just buy something immediately and chances are after the hype dies down a little bit and you see some reviews you'll get a better idea of whether or not it's something that you would be more likely to get a lot of use out of. Um, question number two this actually has multiple parts and this was a really fun one. Um, first is do you remember the first cosmetics you bought with your own money? Yes I do it was the CoverGirl lip slicks in shimmering sandstone. I always used to go to the grocery store with my mother and she didn't really let me wear makeup but I was always so interested in it when I was like 12 13 I would want to just go off on my own and the whole time she was shopping I would spend time in the makeup aisle and just look at all the CoverGirl and Maybelline and L'Oreal products and I finally convinced her to let me buy that because I said it was kind of more like a lip balm it was sheer and she was like okay so I used my allowance and purchased that it was a really frosty color from what I remember and I repurchased it several times but this was back in like the early 90s so I feel like a lot of lip products were really frosty. Next is the first splurge item you bought. I would definitely say that was the Naked 2 palette. I remember saving up my money for that and I was so excited and I remember when the first Naked palette came out and I was like I would never spend 52 or 54 dollars on an eyeshadow palette no way and then there was just so much hype and it blew up and everybody that I knew was talking about it even like non makeup enthusiasts that I knew had that palette and then Naked 2 came out shortly afterwards and that was all cool toned like kind of the gray colors that I love to wear and I was like all right I ended up getting that one and then I bought the Naked 3 and then I think I went back and bought the original because I loved the formula so much and then the third part to this question is the first perfume you ever loved I actually still have it I'll be right back Okay, so I'm really dating myself here, but the first perfume I ever bought and loved is the Electric Youth perfume from Debbie Gibson. I have this one still in the box. It was at my parents' house, like in a closet in my room. And after I left home in my late 20s, it was still there. And my mom boxed up a bunch of my stuff and I found this and was like, I have to keep it. So the color of the perfume is definitely not what it used to be. I wanna say it used to be pink actually and now it's kind of like a funky orange color 
but when I put my nose up to it, like I don't want to spray it. I can still smell it. It brings me back to junior high school. And I know I went through several bottles of this. So this must have been the last one that I bought because it's hardly used at all. I hardly sprayed it. I mean, I still had it even in the box. This could have just been a backup. I don't even know if it's ever been used before, but I like to keep it for the memories. So anyway, um, next, what is your biggest buyer's remorse moment in makeup? Definitely the time that I spent like $89 on the Tom Ford foundation stick, got it home, tried it out and realized it was almost identical to the Wet n Wild Photo Focus foundation stick. Like there's almost no difference between them. I know I've compared them in dupes videos before. I definitely felt remorse with that one because that was the most money I think I had ever spent on a foundation before. And here I am thinking it's gonna be something mind blowing and amazing. And nope, my $5 foundation stick was pretty much the same thing. So I definitely regret that one. Next is what product do so many people love with cult fervor that you just can't get behind? Um, I would have to say probably Pat McGrath eyeshadows and no offense to anybody that loves them. I do think it's a really great formula, but I just I don't see the hype as far as the price tag. I don't think that they're any better than like my Sydney Grace eyeshadows or like other indie brands or even some high-end shadows. Like I enjoy my Huda Beauty palettes that are $65, $70 just as much as my $128 Pat McGrath. So I don't really get the hype with that one, but I know like so many people love them. So I don't want to insult anybody, but that's just my opinion. Question number three, I actually got two comments on this. One said, you've been extra glowy lately and I want to know your secrets. And the second one said, somebody else already said it, but I've been wondering about your secret to the glow you've had lately. You're looking even prettier than normal. So thank you guys so much. Really, I think it's a couple of things. The first one is that I've been using the e.l.f. Halo Glow under my foundation since I got it, which was probably like a month or two ago now. And I really think this makes such a big difference. It kind of shows through your foundation a little and it adds a little bit of a subtle glow, but that's just for starters. I think the second part of it is that I've started wearing highlighter again. I wasn't wearing highlighter for such a long time because I felt like it enhanced my pores and texture on my face. But then recently I rediscovered the Mary Luminizer highlighter from The Balm and I just forgot how smooth and flattering this was on your skin. So I've been wearing this one on my cheeks in so many videos. It's the perfect color and I feel like it's not too bold or shiny, but it's also not subtle. So you can really see it show up well on your skin. It just looks really natural. And I think the third part of it is probably that back in June, I got a tan on vacation. I wasn't meaning to, but we were just out walking around a lot and I didn't reapply my sunscreen. I normally am pretty careful about not getting color so when I got back, I was getting lots of compliments and I just decided to kind of keep it going. Even after my natural tan faded, I've just been using a lot of bronzer, not just on my face, but on my body. I've been using the ColourPop Soul Body Bronzer, which I think is such a nice product. It lasts until you take a shower. It doesn't rub off on anything. I've also been using the Fenty Toasted Swirl Bronze Powder in the shade Chocolate Swiller. And what I did, because this is so huge, I decided to use it for my body. It has a lot of shimmer in it, so I don't really wanna use it on my face, but I bought one of these puffs from Amazon, and what I do is I just swirl the puff into the bronzer, and I've just been applying it to my body and it adds a bunch of color and it just adds this beautiful sheen. So I really love that I can use it for this because when I first tried it on my face, I was like, this is kind of a little bit too much glow all over, but for a body bronzer, it's perfect and it just kind of evens out your skin tone. It's a really creamy blendable powder. So with the puff, it just goes on really evenly and the glow kind of minimizes imperfections. So yeah, those are kind of the three things that I've been doing. The e.l.f. Halo Glow under my foundation, Mary Luminizer, and then bronzing both on my face and on my body. So those are just my little tips and tricks that I've been doing lately. Question number four is, what's your favorite cool tone palette, drugstore, or 
high end. So I think a while ago I probably would have said the Glam Palette from Natasha Denona, but I think I actually use and like the Stone Cold Fox from ColourPop a little bit better. And the reason for that is because I feel like the Natasha Denona palette, while it's beautiful, it does have like that satiny finish when it comes to the shimmer shades. It doesn't have a lot of metallics in it. Whereas I do like that metallic look sometimes and this ColourPop one has both metallic finishes and it also has some of those satiny shimmers as well. And it has pretty much all the same shades that the Glam palette has plus more. So there's just a lot of variety. I'm actually wearing it today. I decided to go with uh, this silver shimmer on my lid and I used this kind of slate gray on the outer corner. So it's great for smokier looks like that, but you can also do very neutral looks with it. It has like some kind of pinky neutrals like dusty mauves. So I would have to say this is definitely my favorite cool tone palette. I reach for this one the most. Question number five said, not a question, but I'd love to see a ranking video of all your tubing mascaras. I can tell you right now without even doing a whole video. Um, number one is definitely the Thrive Liquid Lash Extensions. I like that one the most because not only does it give me the biggest lashes, it also just removes the easiest out of all the ones I've tried. It just comes off with warm water. You don't even need soap or cleanser. It's just really easy to remove and it lasts the entire day. I would say number two would probably be the new Tarte Tartlet Tubing Mascara. That one makes my lashes look almost as good as the Thrive. The only downside with that one is that I don't feel like it removes like a tubing mascara. I notice like some of the tubes coming off in the sink, but I also get smudges under my eyes. Like if I go to dry my face with a towel, I see like mascara smudges on it, which normally you don't find with a tubing mascara. So I think the Tarte one is a little bit more difficult to remove, but I still love how it lasts all day and how it makes my lashes look. And I would say right behind that one would be the LA Colors Biggie Lash. That one has the same issue as the Tarte. It doesn't really remove like a tubing formula, but it lasts like a tubing formula. And it also gives me really nice big, kind of like a false lash look. Number four would probably be the Cali Ray Come Hell or High Water Mascara. That one does remove really easily. It lasts all day without smudging. I just don't think it gives me as big of lashes as the Thrive or the Tarte one. Number five would be the Blink Lash Extension Mascara. I loved this one initially. It removes super easily, lasts all day, but for some reason it dried out so fast that I'm not getting the same results as I was like the first couple of weeks I was using it. And I bought that one in late July and already it's at the point where it's so dry it hardly even builds up. So that one was much higher up on my list before and lately I haven't been loving it as much. Number six would probably be the Hamish Smudge Stop Mascara. I got this one on Amazon and while it does remove really easily and I like the way it makes my lashes look, it flakes, like those little tubes come off during the day and get in my eyes and really just cause a lot of irritation. So I wasn't really a big fan of that one. And the same thing happened with the Emco Lash Extend Tubing Mascara that I tried very recently. That one also flaked into my eyes throughout the day and was super uncomfortable. And then in the final position at number eight would be the number seven Stay Perfect Mascara. I just didn't feel like this did much for my lashes at all. I mean, it removed easily and it stayed all day, but it didn't really give me much in the way of length and volume. So that one was kind of a dud for me. So that's how I would rank all my tubing mascaras from best to worst with Thrive being the absolute best. I still haven't been able to top that one. Question number six is, I'm curious to know how you curl your hair. It always looks so pretty. So thank you guys so much. I always get questions about this. And the reason that I haven't done a video is because the last time I did like a hair routine video, it was like, I think it still is the least viewed video on my channel. Like it completely tanked, nobody watched it. So I'm kind of hesitant to do another one, but I can quickly show you guys how I do my hair. So first and foremost, I do not put any product in my hair before curling it. And the reason for that is just because I have really fine hair and the more product I put in it, the more likely it is to be weighed down and the curls won't last as long. They just kind of fall out. So I shampoo, condition, dry my hair, and then I leave it alone. I don't put anything else in it until the very end. 
So the curling wand that I use is from Numi. They used to carry these at Ulta. I don't think they do anymore, but I've seen them on Amazon. This is the 25 millimeter or one inch. So if you have another one inch curling wand like this, that'll work perfectly fine. And also this is a wand, so it doesn't have the little clippy thing. And I do not use the clip, but if you have one that has a clip, you don't have to use it. You can just wind your hair around the barrel and just not open the clip at all. Another thing about this iron, and I think the reason that the curls last so long is because this does not have a temperature gauge on it so it basically just heats up to I think it's 425 which is pretty hot so I just try not to curl my hair that many times a week usually twice is about it and usually the next day my curls still look good and then other days I'll just wear my hair up or straight or whatever so what I do is I just grab like a small section of hair maybe like an inch wide and I hold the wand upside down so it's pointing downward and I wrap Wrap my hair around the barrel away from my face. To me, this looks a lot better than curling the hair toward your face. And I just hold it there for about five seconds or so. I don't want super tight curls. And also again, because my hair is fine and thin, it doesn't need to sit on the heat that long. If you have thicker, coarser hair, you might need to hold it a little bit longer. And then I just let it go into my hand. I hold it there for just a second and then I let it drop. And I just go through and I do my whole head this way, like just picking up one inch sections, wrapping them around, the same way I try not to go too high up on my head and I also hold about an inch at the bottom of my hair away from the iron so I don't curl the bottom I kind of leave a little bit of that straight I think that just prevents the curls from looking too much like ringlets when I get to the back sections I just kind of hold my hair out to the side and then do it that way so I can see what I'm doing and I tend to grab a little bit bigger sections in the back than I do towards the front and then when it comes to the pieces in the front I tend to grab slightly smaller pieces I think it just looks better for some reason if the curl in the front are just a little bit smaller and they're not quite as like big and chunky they're a little bit more separated and also with those smaller pieces in the front I don't go all the way to the top of my hair I start kind of in the middle and then go down and then when I'm completely done curling my hair I just let it cool for a few seconds and then just run my fingers through it and just kind of fluff it up a little bit and break up the curls so that they don't look too structured and again this just helps it to look a little bit more natural it just kind of blends all the curls together and then at the the end is when I put product in. I used to use shine serums, but on my fine hair, I feel like they just weigh it down so much and they kind of make it a little bit greasy. So the product I like to use is the Living Proof Perfect Hair Day Nightcap Overnight Protector. This is actually something you're supposed to put on at night before bed, but the first day that I got this, I actually did put it on at night and I loved the way it made my hair look so much. I was like, I'm just gonna use this in the day, like to smooth out frizz. It made my hair so bouncy, it added shine. I was like, why would I put this on and then go to bed? It makes my hair look really nice, so I'm not gonna waste that. So I just put one little pump in my hair. I don't like to use too much again, because if I do, it's just gonna weigh everything down. I rub my hands together and I just start in the back. This was a tip that I learned because usually you have more hair in the back it's a little bit thicker so you don't want to put too too much product in the front of your hair because again it'll weigh down like those finer pieces so I just run it through from like the mid shaft of my hair down to the ends and then I work my way toward the front and whatever's left on my hands at the end I'll use to kind of smooth out the top sections but I don't want to put too much product up there again just to avoid weighing it down but adding this product in also kind of calms the curls down just a little bit it makes them more of like that beachy wave adds a bit of shine smooths out the frizz it just is such a nice product so that is basically my hair routine once in a while I'll put a little hairspray like on the root area if I have those little like flyaways and frizzies and stuff like that but otherwise I just leave it alone and my curls last until like I said the next day I sleep on them I wake up and it still looks good the next question actually was also kind of a two-parter I got two questions that were similar the first one says do you find the idea of makeup to be getting old and tiresome now with the overly saturated market 
or are you still as enthusiastic about it as when you first started out? And then the second question is, where do you see the beauty community in five years? Do you think there will still be as big of an audience? I feel like most people's interest in makeup is dwindling. So yeah, this is something I've actually been thinking about a lot lately because I definitely see like a downward trend as far as views go on my channel. I'm not getting the views that I once was. I mean, my channel is still growing, which is good, but I noticed that I don't get like that rush of views the first day that I post a video. Usually they come kind of later or after the fact, I think just sort of when people have time to watch. And I mean, just going back several years, a lot of you who are my age or older probably remember like getting your beauty tips and tricks from magazines. That's basically where I learned all of my tips and tricks and how to apply makeup was from makeup artists and beauty editors writing columns in magazines and kind of showing step-by-steps in photos. So when YouTube came along, it was so eye-opening and exciting because as everybody was showing tutorials on video and you could really see what they were doing and kind of follow along and it was revolutionary. And I think it was just so much easier to learn by actually watching people do their makeup than reading an article about it. And I think back then YouTube was very tutorial heavy. It was very focused around teaching, but then haul videos started becoming more popular and it I noticed a big shift going from teaching to the products themselves. And I feel like we all at that time just bought way too much. We all have such huge collections at this point that it is very overwhelming. And I myself have noticed as a YouTube viewer, I don't watch as much beauty YouTube either. Even though I'm sitting here and doing this and talking about makeup still, it takes a little bit more to get me to click on a video now than it did in the past, I guess. And I also think that the YouTube audience is a little bit more split now. All of the the teens and people in their 20s are over on TikTok. So as a YouTuber, I kind of lost a huge portion of my audience. I think they're more interested in the short form content and just getting really quick reviews as opposed to sitting and watching long form content like this. I mean, of course I'm not speaking for everybody, but I just see it happening more and more. And it's funny cause I notice like over on TikTok when I'm over there, they are sort of experiencing that makeup boom that we have in 2015, 2016, 2017. And I think that's because back then they were little kids. They were not interested in makeup. So they don't have these big collections and they're not overwhelmed, but that's their platform now. So they're getting their information from there instead of from here. And the people that are still here are the ones that are overwhelmed and who have kind of been through that whole makeup boom and are now just like a little bit more weary of it. So I do see a lot of YouTube creators that I follow over on TikTok now and trying to build an audience over there. And I honestly don't know what that means going forward. Honestly, sometimes it keeps me up at night. Like I'm laying there and I'm thinking about like, new ideas, like what could I do? What could I bring to YouTube that's something fresh and different that nobody's done before? Because I feel like we're all burnt out on makeup. I don't know if it means a return back to teaching and tutorials and just, you know, being able to use the makeup that we already have, or if it's like shot my stash style videos. I don't know. I'd love to hear your opinion on this topic because I just keep hearing it over and over again that people are burnt out and I don't know what it would take to get people more excited about makeup again. So I would be really interested in your thoughts on that one for sure. Um, question number nine is, has the smell of a brand new product ever put you off from using it? I can't stand the smell of L'Oreal lipsticks as it's also got a taste, LOL. I agree with you. I can't stand the smell of the L'Oreal lipsticks either. Even anything that has a floral scent, I can't wear it. It gives me a headache. I hate that like kind of soapy taste that they have. It's gross. But when it comes to fragrance in like face makeup, anywhere else other than my lips, I really don't mind it that much. I feel like the smell kind of goes away after a short time. I think when you're putting something on your lips though, it's right underneath your nose. You tend to smell it for a while. And like you said, you taste it. So when it comes to lip products, it either has to be some sort of like a food scent, like either something kind of fruity or a vanilla scent would even be better or just unscented completely. Number 10 is what are your favorite shampoo and conditioner for colored hair? Also your favorite styling products for your hair. So I already kind of talked about the Living Proof Overnight Perfector. This is what I use like after I do my hair. 
Um, but I also love Living Proof Shampoo and Conditioner. My favorite that I've repurchased so many times is the Perfect Hair Day Shampoo and Conditioner. I love them because they're sulfate free so they don't mess with my color and also they're silicone free and so many conditioners in particular have silicones in them and they just tend to build up on your hair over time and leave this film and kind of leaves your hair like less bouncy and it has like a dullness to it. And then you're sort of forced to use like a clarifying shampoo which can be a little bit more damaging and like harsh. And I just think that Living Proof does such an amazing job on their formulas. They were created at MIT. So they're just very scientific about ingredients and how their products work. And they're just a really solid overall company. I like that they're more about the science than they are about like the hype or pretty packaging. I just feel like they do such a great job. Question number 11 is how do you get makeup to look decent on your nose? So I'm assuming you mean like to stick to your nose and not constantly break up because I know I always had that issue until I saw, I think it was Wayne Goss had a video about this exact topic a while ago and he suggested putting eyeshadow primer on your nose, specifically the Urban Decay Primer Potion. So I've been using the Urban Decay one for that exact purpose and it really does help it to grip so much better and it lasts a lot longer. I think in his tutorial, he actually suggested putting face primer first, then powdering your nose, then putting this on top of the powder, and then put your foundation. But because I have dry skin, I don't normally powder. I usually just do this and then put the foundation and it works so much better and it lasts a lot longer throughout the day. I'm not sure if other eyeshadow primers work as well as this one. I've just only tried it with this one, but that was a really good tip and I found that it works really well. Question number 13 is eyeshadow for hooded lids. How do you make the eyes look bigger? Are darker or lighter colors better? I would say definitely lighter colors. I was always the one to use a really dark color all the way across my lid. I loved like that smoky eye kind of effect, but then when I watched countless videos about hooded eyes, I realized that lighter colors actually make your eyes come forward, whereas darker colors make things recede more into shadow. So what I normally do with my hooded eyes is a little bit of both. I usually use a lighter color from the inner corner to about like maybe a little more than midway. And then I use a darker color at the outer corner to add lift. But you definitely need that lighter color to make your lid pop more and come a little bit more forward. You'll just notice it more. And another thing I do is usually just put it a little bit above my natural crease just to kind of fake the illusion of less hooded eyes. Question 14 is, do you have friends or family in real life who love makeup as much as the YouTube beauty community? And do parents or teachers at your son's school know that you have a YouTube channel? Uh, no, <laughs> to both questions. My friends and family are not as into makeup as I am. Some of them are into it a little bit. There's a few of them that watch my channel, but to be honest with you, I haven't told most people about my YouTube channel, even like people that I know. I don't wanna say like I'm embarrassed, that's not really the right word, but for some reason it's easier to me to just think about strangers watching than people that I know really well. I don't know why. And as far as like parents or teachers at my son's school, I've never told anybody it's possible that some of them may have seen my videos and maybe like put the connection together but they've never said anything to me I've never said anything to them so yeah it's just one of those things that I kind of like don't talk about in my personal life it, it, that might be weird but question number 15 says I hate to do it to you but if you could only use one brand for life what would it be okay let's just limit it to eyeshadows one brand for everything is cruel um well, if it were just eyeshadows, I would definitely say ColourPop because they come out with something almost every week. I think I would never get bored. I love their formula so much. And even as far as like a one brand, I could probably just use ColourPop and be fine because they have everything. They have all categories of makeup. They even have the skincare, the body products. I mean, I really don't think I would get bored with ColourPop. So I think I'm gonna go with them. I think the only thing I might struggle with a little bit is like complexion products products because I'm not as into their foundations and concealers, but I, they're not terrible. Like I could probably make them work. Question 16 is how does your skin cope with all the new products and still look amazing on camera? Um, I would have to say that's just luck. My skin is tough. I generally do not have issues with breakouts. I don't have issues with 
rashes or irritation. And this goes back to even like when I was in my 20s and I was working at Sephora, I would constantly be trying new products. The brands would bring us new makeup and new skincare. And I was changing my skincare up pretty much weekly because I wanted to keep up on all of the new products and really know about all the things we were selling. And I remember some people that I worked with coming in and saying like, my skin is like freaking out. I keep using too many new things. And everybody would always be like, how is your skin fine? How is it like that it's not bothering you? And I don't know, for some reason, my skin just tolerates change really well. Um, question number 17, what's the worst foundation you've ever tried? Well, I don't know if it's a foundation exactly, but I would have to say the Maybelline Fit Me Tinted Moisturizer was probably the absolute worst product I've ever put on my skin. I don't know how that one even got through testing because I think everybody had the same reaction when that came out. Everybody's video was negative. It's one of those products that you just put it on and it does not stick to your skin. It doesn't stick to itself if you wanna layer up. I know I was just like rubbing it into my skin and it just looks streaky and patchy and it wouldn't stay. Like I would try to blend it and then there would be like a patch right here with nothing and then I'd try to blend into that patch and then it would disappear from over here. And I just felt like I was chasing it all around my face and it just looked awful, it pilled up. That one was definitely by far the worst. Question number 18 is, as an influential person on YouTube, what are you allowed and not allowed to do on your channel or with products you get? And also how often do you get makeup sent to you in PR? How often do you buy your own? Um, so the first part of the question, as far as what I'm allowed and not allowed to do, you can pretty much do almost anything on YouTube. I mean, you can curse. There are certain things you could do, I think that would get your channel taken down. If you were promoting hate or maybe like really dangerous behavior, I don't think they would leave that up. YouTube does make you rate your video before you upload it as far as ad suitability. So if it checks any of these boxes, it may not run ads on your video or there may not be as many. So for example, um, inappropriate language, adult content, violence, showing hurt, damage, or injury, shocking content, it says situations that may upset, disgust, or shock viewers, harmful or dangerous acts, recreational drugs content, anything that's glorifying or promoting dishonest behavior, hateful or derogatory content, firearms related content, sensitive events dealing with war, death, or tragedy, or controversial issues that could be unsettling for viewers. So basically you just have to run down the list and check any of those things that might apply to your video. Mine never do, so it's ad friendly, but otherwise you can pretty much do what you want. You just have to know that you may be deep monetized. As far as what I'm allowed or not allowed to do with products that I get, generally when a company is sending PR, the one thing we're not allowed to do is sell the products. So if they catch us selling things on Mercari or Poshmark or eBay, they can just stop sending us PR. We'll get kicked off the list. But otherwise we can do what we want with it. I mean, we can give it away. We can talk about it, not talk about it. Usually there's no strings attached. They're sending it just in the hopes that we might mention it and if we do it could be negative or positive most companies don't care there have been a few companies i've worked with who took me off the pr list after a negative review but then there's been others who continue to send me products like one example would be milani like i have said so many times I hate their new eyeshadow formula, but they still send me products, which I think is really great because it shows that they're open to criticism and they're willing to still work with you. So it just depends on the brand. And as far as how often do I get makeup sent to me in PR, I get stuff every week but I don't get as much as I used to. It used to be that there was like something coming in the mail every single day. And I don't know if companies are just reining in how much PR they're sending or if they're just sending it to people on TikTok more than YouTubers now, it could be that. Cause I feel like people on TikTok are always getting PR and I definitely don't get as much as I used to. So I'm guessing that's probably the case. Um, but as far as like how often do I buy on my own, I would say I buy more products than I get now in PR. 
I have a certain budget, a certain slice of the income that I make from YouTube that I just use on buying new products for my channel. I don't spend all of my income on it, but I definitely do put quite a bit back into the channel. Question number 19 is, what's your favorite type of video to film? I would definitely say dupes videos. I just love the whole process from discovering the dupes in my collection, just going through and swatching and comparing and making that list of drugstore products that are just as good as high end to like just talking about it. It's just exciting to me. And especially knowing that you guys love those videos and generally like it's going to get a lot of views and a lot of interest. And I always love putting out content that I know you guys enjoy. So that makes me feel good too. So it's just a win-win all the way around. I love those videos. All right guys, so I think I'm gonna go ahead and just end the video here. It's probably long enough already. Um, if I didn't get to your question, hopefully I will be able to get to it next time. But but I hope you all enjoyed this video and found it helpful. I do really enjoy making these videos too. I think they're a lot of fun. If you enjoyed it, definitely hit the thumbs up button. And if you're new to my channel, I hope you'll consider subscribing before you go. Thank you all so much for just hanging out with me as always. I really appreciate it so much. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Take care guys. Bye.